gonna, if you're going to preach straight, you've got to get the pulpit straight. So there's preaching, crooked preachers, there's too many of them, right? Tonight, uh, I, I announced that I was going to preach one thing, and I, and I had another thing, and I just felt led to switch it, so I did. And uh, so I, I hope, I, I don't know why I felt led, but I, I'm positive that I felt led. I'm not just saying that. And so um, I'm preaching on, I'll do what you want me to do. It's the title from Acts chapter 8, if you take your Bibles. And we'll begin in verse 26 in just a moment, verse 26 of Acts 8. Uh, remember the old song, some of you might remember it, I'll go where you want me to go. The chorus goes, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or a mountain or plain or sea, I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord, I'll be what you want me to be. And I remember as a teenager singing that, and, uh, and my heart was so sincere. But uh, uh, as far as what I thought I might be able to do was not much at all. And I, I'm still in the, in the, in the natural man uh, not confident in what I can do, but I know that God can do things if we will be bold enough to step out to to speak what God gives us to speak and, and try to do what God asks us to do and go where he wants us to go. Uh, some of the words say, it may not be on mountains height or over the stormy sea. It may not be at the battle's front. My Lord will have need of me, but if by a still small voice he calls to pass, I do not know. I'll answer, dear Lord, with my hand in thine. I'll go where you want me to go. Uh, there's surely somewhere a lowly place in earth's harvest field so wide where I may labor through life's short day for Jesus the crucified. So trusting my all into thy care, I know thou lovest me. I'll do thy will with a heart sincere. I'll be what you want me to be. What a beautiful words of a, of a great hymn. And then the song we would sing, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I always do my part to win that soul for thee. We can have a religious club, even a Christian religious club that's saved and going to heaven and conduct ourselves as an inward Christian community that strengthens each other. But if we fail to obey God's command and heart to go into the world, uh, I, I believe we failed miserably, that we go into all the world and preach the gospel. And tonight, I just want you to grab a hold of these thoughts. That number one, God will use you. God has a plan for you, just like he had a plan for Philip long ago, who was one of, one of the people that God had anointed as deacon. Father, I ask your Holy Spirit to help me communicate in Jesus' name this truth that will help us all Hopefully, Lord, to be soul winners in uh, the year 2017, even now, we pray, God, because our world is empty without you. Our world is in darkness. So many people un called under the banner of Christ are Christless in behavior and in spirit. I pray, God, that you would awaken us and awaken the church and let us be all that we're called to be and do all that you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes in order to face the future, you have to take a look back at the past. And if we want to understand what the church ought to be doing in the 21st century now, we need to take a look at what the church did in the first century. Do we always look back at the beginning? We look at Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and, and what they were up to. And so if you take your Bible in Acts chapter 8, we'll be reading from there in a, in a moment. I remember, I, I, uh, you know, the thing about it is God may not lead you across an ocean. He may not lead you to a pulpit, but he's going to lead you, and he has a plan for you. And uh, I could ask today, uh, how many of you are in this place that are missionaries that are here? But I don't want you to lift your hands because it might embarrass you if you don't lift your hand because after I tell you what I'm going to say here, I, 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 because I want to say that every one of us that's saved is called to be a missionary. Not necessarily paid, not necessarily in a foreign land, but in our neighborhood, at our job, at our school, wherever we are, because the missionary is a sent one. It's one that is sent, and we have a mission, and that mission is to take this gospel to the whole world. And, uh, and we're saved from sin, and, and, and we're one that says, hey, God, Whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I'll say what you want me to say when you give it to me to say. I want to be used of God. And uh, these are desperate days we're living in, and the problems that we're facing are, and the times that we live in are desperate. But we as saints are not. 
We have a promise. We have a hope. We have a vision. But we sit back sometimes, and we don't sense the desperation of our culture and the desperation of what needs to happen and how God needs to move. And we, we come to church on Sunday, and then we think we've done God a favor, and what a good boy I am. I went to church. I even put something in the offering plate. But uh, I, 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 I want today, tonight, before I finish, I want you to cry out, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I want you every morning to get up and say, God, give me a divine appointment. Give me a divine instruction and, and direction of your spirit that I would follow so that I might be used of you in a special way. Whatever he commands, will you say, I will do it. I'll do what you want me to do. So Acts chapter 8, verse 26, this is Philip. It says, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip. And if you remember, Philip was a deacon. He was one of the first seven deacons chosen over in Acts chapter 6. The Bible says of him he was a man of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit. And he, he wasn't an ordained minister in the sense of that word. He was what we would call a missionary in the strictest sense of the word. And, and, and you read the beginnings of Acts 8, and I hope that you'll do that tonight. You'll go back where Philip had gone different places and Philip was being used. And now it, 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 it records for us that the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem into Ga unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. And uh, Acts 28, verses, Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 28. And the first thing I want you to see is that you must perceive the call of God. God's got a call for you, a purpose. You know, it's simple what the world needs. Jesus was a great teacher. And he understood the need of humanity, and it was the gospel. And it was to understand significance, that we're not here on this earth just to play games, video games, and go through life having entertainments because it's void. It ends up empty. And so there is significance that is eternal that God gives us. And we have a call of God in our lives, and we must perceive that. And if, if, if you would want to be used of God, you have to, number one, say, I'll do what you want me to do. You must perceive the call of God. And in verse 26, the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Philip, and he said, Philip, this is what I want you to do. I want, you to, I want to be very frank with you. I want you to go, and I'm telling you exactly where to go to. Go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza. He says, go. And, uh, you know, God's never spoken to me by an angel. As a you, I think sometimes I've sensed angels, but I've never been spoken by. And uh, maybe we've been met with angels, but we didn't know it. Hebrews mentions being, Hebrews 13, 2 mentions angels unawares. And I mean, there are people who may be God's angels, and we didn't know it. But notice the angel, God spoke to his heart, and by the angel in this case, and he didn't send the angel to talk to the Ethiopian. He sent Philip. And God speaks in many ways, but he, does, he will speak and he'll use you. And you say, why doesn't God use me? It may be that you're not usable. You know, God never leaves a surrendered vessel unfilled. God never leaves a surrendered vessel unfilled. And he never, ever doesn't use a filled vessel. When he fills the vessel, he always uses it. He never leaves a filled vessel unused. You surrender yourself, and he'll fill you, fill, fill you with the Spirit. And, uh, and, and I mean, so that to get filled, sometimes you have to get empty. You empty it of pride and self and ambition and greed, empty of your lust, empty of, of your desires and your function and what your uh, goals are and of your humanity, and then God will use you. And uh, just as he had a plan for Philip, he has a plan for you. And Philip was just an ordinary guy that God used in extraordinary ways. And, and let me say something about the, the working of God and how God does that. I want to say this, that God often, often, God's ways are often unknown. You mark that down. 
God's ways are often unknown. You must perceive the call of God, and in doing so, sometimes his ways are unknown. Philip had no way of knowing that he was going to be used of God to win, who he was going to be used to God to win. And this man that he was sent to was a strategic man. Philip was getting ready to witness, one of the most, witness to one of the most influential men in all of North America. And a man that was used of God to open up all of North America to the gospel. Philip had no way of knowing that. All he knew was that God had spoken to him to go, to, down, go south to Gaza. And he said, yes, sir, I'll go. And you have no way of knowing how God is going to use you if you'll obey God. As a matter of fact, it would probably sometimes blow our minds if we could really understand what God had plans for us in our future, of what God could do. There was a, a man by the name of Kimball. Anybody heard that name? Kimball. He's a, he's a man that led Dwight L. Moody to Jesus Christ. And about more than a century ago, Kimball was a Sunday school teacher, and he, he led Moody to, to Jesus Christ. And, and who, who was Moody? And I know young people don't know, but he was kind of like a t contemporary Billy Graham. Well, you may not know him, but uh, he's the best example I got, so if you don't know him, I'm sorry. But he was different from Billy Graham. Billy Graham was educated and so forth and cultured and intelligent. And not that Moody wasn't intelligent, but he was an orphan. Moody was an orphan at the age of four, and he didn't have any opportunity to get a formal education in fact, in his last letter that Moody wrote before his death, there were almost 40 gra grammatical errors in his letter. That only encourage you that God can use anybody. Uh, he absolutely murdered the King's English or the Queen's English, whatever you want to say, uh, but he didn't disappoint the Lord Jesus Christ, the King. And he loved the Lord. And uh, this unlettered man, this uh, uh, was a mighty man. He was proficient in the gospel, even though he was uncultured and not overly educated, he, he, he saw God, God using to move two continents, both uh, that of America and Europe for Christ. Moody went to England, and you can imagine, he was a shoe clerk, and you can imagine, that's all he was, and he preached in Cambridge. If you don't think about Cambridge, you're going, really? Uneducated Mr. Moody in Cambridge preaching the gospel. And there in Cam Cambridge was a young athlete, and his name was C.T. Studd, now, Stud was the great, one of the greatest athletes of all time. And, and in England, cricket is the big, you know, it's like football. And uh, he was fantastic. He was known as one of the, the great uh, seven, the, the amazing players that ever played uh, cricket. And he was, a, uh, the, rather, the 11. He was known as the Cambridge, one of the Cambridge 11. He was a man of great ability, great charm, great wealth. His father was a personal friend of the Queen of England and was a multimillionaire. And Stud, C.T. Stud, had everything. I mean, he had the looks, the mind, the money. He had it all. Athletic ability. But when he heard Moody, Moody preach, God touched his life. And he resigned from athletics. He no longer was a member of the Cambridge 11 playing cricket. He was called to another seven, the Cambridge Seven, the seven who went to China and began one of the mightiest movements of modern missions has ever known. You know what Stud said, this man so greatly used of God, under the influence of Moody, here's what he said to ask him, what motivated you to do, to do what you did, to leave that wealth, to leave the prestige, to leave it all? And he said this, if Christ be God and died for me, and I quote, if Christ be God and died for me, then there is no sacrifice I can make too great for him. If Christ be God and died for me, there's no sacrifice too great for me to make for him. God's ways are often unknown. The man who led Moody to Christ had no idea that Moody would be used in such a mighty way as he was. You may not know, but Philip had no idea that he was going to be used of God to win the strategic man, but he obeyed, and he obeyed instantly, and it was a thrilling story, it's exciting stories. And God's ways uh, are, are not always, uh, are, are often unknown. And secondly, his ways as we respond to the call of God are often unexplained. Unknown and unexplained. God didn't have to give a Philip any reason why to go. He just said go. He didn't give an answer. Just sealed orders and perfect obedience doesn't need to know why. And God may speak to you through an angel, but he's going to speak to you. He may not speak to you through an angel too, I mean. But he's going to speak to you. And uh, the Holy Spirit begins to work on the individual, an unsaved sinner. 
He begins to soften the sinner's heart for the gospel. And he brings influences or whatever he needs to to that person. Then God finds a man over here or a woman over here. And he brings the heart of this person and he puts them at the right place at the right time for the person that has the heart in the morning to say, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. I'll say what you want me to say. Lord, help me win some soul for you. And God will put you in the exact place to, uh, to win someone. And here's Philip uh, way up in Samaria. And here's the eunuch way down in Gaza. And God brings the two of them together supernaturally. And as you study the Bible and great experiences of salvation in the Bible, it happens so often. For instance, Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 4, he says, and he must needs go through Samaria. So the woman at the well in Samaria, uh, Jesus said, and it was John 4, 4, and he felt the divine compulsion to go through Samaria. It did, he didn't say, hey, let's, why don't we just go through Samaria? No, he must needs. He went through Samaria, and there was a Samaritan woman there that had a thirst that Jesus met so that she would not thirst again. And it was a divine appointment. You can read about you can also read in Acts chapter 10 where there was a man by the name of Cornelius. Remember that? And he was a Gentile of, uh, of the Italian band. He, he had a thirst, a hunger to know God. And you can read how God took Simon Peter and God brought the two together. A divine appointment. God cares about the lost. He's stirring the hearts of people. And, and you may, may, or not, may or may not know this, but if you listen to any, any missionary that ministers in areas that believe in the false god, the false Muslim God, you'll know that angels are appearing to people that are sincerely seeking truth and seeking out God. Angels still appear and speak to people. And, uh, but you first, number one, have to perceive the call of God. Is the call of God for everyone? Are you called to go to be a missionary? Listen to what God is saying. And here, when Philip saw this man, he ran to the man. He, I want you to see how he obeyed God. If you'll look in verse 27 to 30 in the text in Acts 8. Uh, uh, and, and he says, and he arose and went. Right away, he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He's reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself to the chariot. And Philip ran thither to him. Notice Philip doesn't wait. He doesn't argue with the Lord. So many times we miss opportunities that pass by us. And, uh, and so, so, Here's a man in a chariot. This is graphically described here. Philip had to run. It says he ran to catch him. A few moments later, and it would have been too late. I'll show you why in a minute. Philip would have, would have reasoned with himself. He'd have just said, now, wait a minute. He's an Ethiopian. I'm Jewish. No. Or, or we got a race problem here. No. Or he could have said, look, he's rich. I'm just a poor guy. You know, there's a socioeconomic problem. Or he could have said, hey, he's reading. It's kind of rude to interrupt him. I'm not going to interrupt him. I'm not going to bother him and argue with God. And, and, and so you see what Philip did was he simply answered the Lord when he spoke. He didn't let race or riches or reading or anything else come, come between him and what God wanted. He went and he ran and he immediately, and, and you're like, just like the song, our God is marching on, or the, 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 it says, I owe be swift my soul to answer him. Be, I shouldn't sing, should I? Be jubilant my feet, our God is marching on. So you need to get yourself sensitive to the Lord to be walking in the stream of the Spirit because here's a man who's been to Jerusalem to worship. Listen, he's searching. He's been to Jerusalem to worship. He's coming back. He's been to the most religious city on the face of the earth, and the wells of religion are dry. There is nothing. They're dry. His soul is thirsty. He's reading the prophet Isaiah, and we're going to show you in a moment. It was right to the heart of the gospel. He was reading in Isaiah chapter 53, believe it or not. He's right in the part that speaks about Christ dying for our sins. And there's just a split second. I mean, a split second. The timing is perfect when Philip gets there to, to confront, to talk to him and, as, God would, as he obeyed God. It was perfect. And uh, I wonder how many opportunities we've missed because we're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. And we need God to ask God, help us be sensitive. Help us be immediately obedient. Help us be courageous. And so, number one, help us to perceive the call of God. It's so important that we do this. We have to see that we are called. And so, the second thing you'll see he did is second, not only perceive the call, but preach the Christ of God. Preach Jesus. Perceive the call of God and preach the Christ of God. 
And a lot of people call themselves missionaries today and they do things like build water wells or build buildings or, or they, they start schools or whatever and kind of has the name of Christ on it, but they're not preaching the, the gospel. Thank God that our missionaries, when we build the water wells, are preaching the gospel and lots of people are getting saved. And, and, and I'm, I'm telling you that because this, the, the, the country of Tanzania is being taken over by the assemblies of God. It won't be but a few years and almost the whole nation will be assembly of God. It's that much of a revival there happening. And thank you for participating and giving to help build those water wells that help them be able to preach Jesus. It's good to do things like that, but it can never take the place of preaching Jesus Christ. You can't just have a little socialism with a little religion sprinkled on top. It's not good enough. We got to preach the gospel of Jesus. And that's what a real missionary does. I want you to see what Philip did here. It, it, Begin in verse 30, verse 30, and Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? And just underscore that phrase because it makes our job to it make the word of God plain. We want to, our job is to make it plain. So do you understand what you're reading? Well, he didn't. Well, that's our job to make it plain. God's job is to do the saving. And he wants to make it plain through us. It's not our job to be successful. It's our job to be faithful, to proclaim, to teach, and to make the message clear and help people understand that can't understand unless the, the, we can show them. And he said, how can I? He said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I except some man should guide me? And, uh, and notice it's a man, not an angel. The angel could have gone there to Philip, but God wanted, uh, instead of Philip, but God wanted Philip to go to the Ethiopian. And unless a man should guide me. And, and then uh, notice it says, then Philip opened his mouth. Starting in verse, verse 35, you look at verse 35. Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. In other words, he was in Isaiah 53 and he began to preach that scripture. And, uh, and uh, he was reading at the place, it says there, in, starting in verse 31. Go back to 31 again. Acts 8, 31, how can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And he said, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself or some other man. In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and he began the same scripture. At the same scripture, he preached Jesus. In other words, he took Isaiah 53 and he preached Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of, of, our, of our peace was upon him. And uh, he took hit the sin upon himself. And there's three points, simple facts of Philip's message right from Isaiah 53 that he, sh he shows to, the, to this uh, to this uh, eunuch, to this Ethiopian. Number one, Philip showed the man he was a sinner. And uh, all week, Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've each one turned to his own way and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, six. He's a sinner. Everybody must know they're a sinner and admit they're a sinner. You're not gonna change or get a savior unless you know you're a sinner. Nobody's ever been saved who has not first admitted that they're a sinner. And, and you have two categories of people in churches a lot of times that are, that are not saved. One thinks they're, they're good and they don't need to be saved. They don't really say it, but they don't do all these bad things. The other one is so bad they think they can't be saved. And the devil's working in both, they're both lies. And, um, and they think, well, I wish I could be like those nice church people, but I'm just not that. And God doesn't have anything to do with me. This lie, it's a lie. Nobody, there is nobody so good that he doesn't need to be saved and nobody so bad that they can't be saved. Nobody so good they don't have to be saved and nobody so bad that they can't be saved. You turn to Romans 3, 23 and you say, you see all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see that Christ died for our sins in Romans 6, 23. Years ago over in England, they had a beauty contest and they were using it to promote a product and it was unusual but beauty contest because it was anybody over 40. But guess what? They had a huge prize but no one ever claimed the prize because no one signed up for the beauty contest because every woman over 40 didn't think they were beautiful. 
And that's a lie of the devil. But in, nonetheless, I guess, depends on how your view is. But the point is, there are some people who will never possess salvation because they won't admit that they're sinners. And I don't mean just admit it, but acknowledge it before God. Oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's the prayer. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And Philip made known to this Ethiopian that Christ had died for his sins. And you see, you don't get saved until you admit that. You need Jesus as your Savior. There's an old story of a king. It's a great story. Listen to it. You probably never heard it. He was visiting a slave gallery ship where they chained the slaves to the oars and made them pull the oars. They would chain them there and made them pull the oars. And people uh, were put in those ships, and they were prison ships, prisoners of the state, and for uh, people who had done horrible things, uh, sorts of crimes, and this was their sentence for their crime, to put the oars beneath the decks and to, as, and, and to do this. So the king visited one of these ships, and he, and he asked a man, hey, why are you here? And he said, king, he said, I'm here, not, it wasn't really my fault. The reason I'm here is because I was framed. I wasn't guilty. I was lied on in a law of court. And the king said, oh, that's so tragic. That's such a shame. And he went to the next man. He said, why are you here? He said, oh, he said, your honor, I'm like the other man. I'm innocent, he said. I was simply in a crowd when a crime was made and committed, and I was arrested with the others. Have mercy on me, king. And the king said, oh, that's tragic, my man, that you should be in such a situation. And he went to one man after another, and they all had the same tale except for one man. And he said to this one, he said, now why are you here? He said, sir. He said, I'm here because I'm a criminal. I have sinned against my God. I have sinned against my king. I have sinned against my fellow man. And now I'm suffering the just reward for my deed. When the king heard that, he said, you, you, you rascal, you. He says, what in the world are you doing in here among all these honest, innocent men? Guards, release this man and get him out of here. And that's exactly what Jesus does when we admit that we're sinners. He says, he'll have mercy upon us, just like the king had mercy upon the man that was at, at honest about his transgression and his crime. So it needs to, he, we need to first show a man that they've sinned, preach the three points. He showed that he was a sinner, and he showed that the, this man that Christ died for his sins. And uh, as a sheep, it says, as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth, it says in Isaiah. And then Philip opened his mouth and began the same scripture and preached unto them Jesus, it says. In Acts 32 to 35, and no matter what else you preach, tell people that Christ died for their sins. When you're a missionary, when you're sharing, Jesus died for their sins. He took your place. All we like sheep have gone astray and we have turned everyone to our own way and God hath laid upon him, Jesus, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Jesus took my sin and he went to Calvary. I take his righteousness and I go to heaven. That's what the gospel is. Jesus takes my sin and dies. I take his righteousness and I live and I have heaven as my home. It's simple, so, so simple sometimes. The child can see it, but a college professor can't get it at all. It just stumbles all over it. There was a, a, a woman, and I will close with this story. There was a woman who was a washerwoman. She got saved, and she didn't have a great education. There was a skeptic, a sinner, who knew her and said, well, Betty, I'm here. I hear you got religion last week. Tell me what it's like to be a saint. She said, well, I'm not sure that I know what a saint is. He said, well, uh, tell me what happened to you. Okay, so she said, uh, I learned something called the grace of God and that Jesus died for me and I accepted him as my personal Savior and Lord and he's forgiven my sins and saved me. And oh, he said, you're saved, he said. Tell me, what does it feel like to be saved? And she said, well, I don't think I could explain it to where you could understand it. But she said, to me, it's though I'm standing in Jesus' shoes and he's standing in mine. That's grace. You're not saved by grace and works together, folks. You're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. It's faith alone that saves, but faith that saves is never alone. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ that we have eternal life. And he taught this man the third thing, that salvation is by grace through faith. And uh, so the, it goes on in, in our text in verse 36. It says... Uh, and as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, 
See, here's water. What, what's going to hinder me from being baptized? And Philip said, and just mark this down, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. See, Paul taught him that salvation is by grace through faith, that it has to be faith first before you're baptized. And that baptism is a public thing to say, I, I have faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, you don't have to have a PhD to understand that that the righteousness of Jesus becomes yours and the sin you sh that you sin be is taken by Jesus Christ. He takes your place on the cross and you get to bear his name and his righteousness becomes yours. That's why it's about the cross. That's why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, of, of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God and the salvation unto everyone that believes. And uh, that's why the, Paul and Silas were able to tell the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved in your house. So can a person know they're saved? I think absolutely, you should know. We should not be insecure believers. These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life, John says. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the sons of God, we are saved. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant about it, but it's true. In fact, here's a scripture that most people don't know, hasn't ever, haven't ever seen or marked. Look, mark it down and look at it, Romans 4, 16. And it says, therefore, it is of faith that it, that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. To the end the promise might be sure. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. It's of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure might be sure. If there were any other plan of salvation, then you couldn't be sure. If God were to say, everybody wants to be saved, read a chapter in the Bible, and some people can't read. Everybody that wants to be saved, they, depending on their works, uh, get them to heaven. Well, if you're living good enough, when you die, then you're going to go to heaven. Listen, is there anybody who would stand up and say, today, yesterday, tomorrow, they're going to be perfect? And I don't think so. You see, I'm telling you, you're gonna, you, you miss it and you'll be eternally insecure if you're looking at the level of your works and how good you walk. So one more verse, Romans 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I can't work my soul to say, for that my Lord hath done, but I will work like any slave for the love of God's dear son. But I don't work in order to be saved. I work because I am saved. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And the minute I add works to it, then grace is no more grace. Well, Dale Atchison wants to give me a Mercedes. He says, Pastor, I'm gonna buy you a Mercedes. I want, and I said, well, I want the nicest one they got, $80,000, all the trimming. I want everything. And uh, I don't want a cheap one. And he said, well, this is for you because I love you. And I say, Dale, now, wait a minute. I can't just let you buy this whole Mercedes from where. Here's a quarter, Dale. Let me help you pay for it. So I give Dale a quarter, and he pays $79,999.75, and I pay my two bits. And I drive that car, and somebody says, nice car, Pastor Weaver. I say, y'all, Dale bought this car for me. Dale and I together, we bought it. Huh? I add my two bits worth of effort to what he did. Let me tell you that. When you know Jesus died on the cross and you try to get there by works, you're adding your two bits. It's worthless of what you could do. The righteousness of all the greatest people that ever lived wrapped together is like filthy rags before God. And we need to be thankful and we need to share this message because it's a message that frees people and people hear nothing but a religious church message and a religion message and they miss the salvation message that is in Jesus Christ. Preach Christ, be called to God and practice what God has done, has given you to do. If you haven't been baptized in water, then do what Philip did, and what to the eunuch did rather, the Ethiopian is go ahead and be baptized as he did. That's what you should do if you haven't. Then be, obey the commands of God. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your goodness. And I pray, Lord, you would help us tonight, Lord, to uh, hear your call, hear your cry, commit our way to you, God, and be missionaries. Do what, what you want us to do, God. Go where you want us to go. Say what you want us to say. Be what you want us to be. 
Lay some soul upon our heart, God. We don't want to just go on having church and having religion and having a class and learning more and more and more, pouring more and more knowledge in us and sitting there like the old songwriter said, like, like, like fat babies, spiritually fat babies. I pray, God, that we would be about the Father's business and see that the souls of men are on the heart of Jesus. That's why he died. He, he was sent to seek and save the lost, to give his life a ransom for many. That God so loved us and loved everybody that that's what he gave himself for. I pray, Lord God, for, for those that are, that are struggling, Lord, I, I thank you for your provision uh, of helping them, God. I, I know there's several that have got things going on, and I, and I pray, Lord, you'd be with them. I pray for the Applegate family again as they face the funeral of their young son, and uh, I just pray you'd have a special, special grace for them in Jesus' name. Amen.